My, my son Zakaria, he is my oldest son, he's 10 years old now, alhamdulillah. And he goes to the Muslim Scouts, okay? And in the Muslim Scouts, they do this like Muslim, Muslim Olympics, yeah? It's really cool, you have like 1,000 children there, 800 or 1,000 children in this auditorium and, and, and they're doing, you know, Olympic running and all the different type of sports. And, you know, I try to be a father when, 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 when I can, when I want, when I try to be, yeah? You know, may Allah make me a good dad. And, um, I, wanted him, <laughs> sorry, I wanted to give him advice and I said to him, you know, Zakaria, it's not about winning. He was doing the 400 meter race. I said, it's not about winning, Zakaria. It's about being the best version of yourself. Having a sense of ihsan, right? Because Allah has given you tools and gifts. You don't know what they are, but you know they're amazing and you want to use them to the best of your ability. And if you use them to the best of your ability, this is shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because ihsan is linked to shukr in my view. Because Allah has given you tools Use them excellently as best as possible and this is a sign of gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You could win Zakaria, but you didn't do your best and you really failed. And you could lose and do your best and you were truly successful because you, you, you had ihsan. He went, Baba, that's deep. <laughs> yeah? So I was giving him this advice as just be yourself, just express yourself. It's not about winning or losing. I just want you to be the best that you can be. So. It starts on your marks, get set. It was phenomenal. He was going so fast. He was like, oh my God. Like he looked like, the, he was like in his own. Like, you know when you have children as a father, you know when your child is like in that very rare moment, self-expressive, not caring what people think. In that age, they care a little about what mom thinks, dad thinks, other children think. But he was like in the moment, he was in a social spiritual vacuum. He was like, I was like so like, I was overwhelmed, yeah? <laughs> Sorry. And um, I had Ilyas, my other son, on my shoulders and lots of Asians, some continent conservative lot there. And I'm the kind of guy that doesn't, I don't care what people think now. I'm 36 years old, I don't give a damn. I got Ilyas on my shoulders, I'm wearing a Bruce Lee top, I got some crazy tracksuit, I'm more disheveled, I got wearing some crazy boots. I'm going through the middle of the Olympic Park going, Come on, Zachariah! Beautiful baby! I'm holding a mirror, some uncle. Beautiful baby! Running around. Excellent, Zachariah! Brilliant! Brilliant! I was in the moment. I was like, wow! He came second, alhamdulillah. When he stopped, he looked at me as if it was, you know, I found a part of myself that I haven't found before. Yeah? These are very rare moments, right? And I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> Sorry, why, why did I react that way? Because I noticed an attribute in Zachariah that I believe deserved praise. I noticed something in Zachariah that I thought as a father deserves some praise. Now we do this all the time, don't we? When we hear great poetry of Iqbal, SubhanAllah, right? When we see our famous Nasheed artists, we're like, wow, what a great Nasheed. We give them a standing ovation, we clap, we applaud. We, we all the time praise people for their aptitude and their abilities. Mo Farah, the Olympic runner. Even when Mo Farah was doing the Olympics, I even stood up saying, come on Mo, right? And I was like, wow, what a brilliant runner. I like boxing, when I see great boxers, recently Anthony Joshua fought Klitschko, he got knocked down in the sixth round, he got back up, the tenacity, the sagacity, I was like, whoa, inspirational, right? We do this all the time. We give people a standing ovation, we praise, we clap, we say well done, because we notice attributes in people that deserve due praise, right? <laughs> but look at this universe. Look what we discussed for the past few days. Kun ya kun. We have the ability to have rational insights. We have consciousness. We have this amazing complexity. We have physical laws in the universe. If they were different, we wouldn't have life. 
we have this life sensitive arrangement of stars and celestial objects that if they were different we wouldn't have conscious life on earth look at earth we have plants that move with the sun we have animals that could stand their weight many times over look what's happening on this planet we have seeds that germinate because of the heat of forest fires they only germinate from the heat of forest fires we have birds that can fly for days at a time without truly sleeping because they have two parts of the brain, one sleeps, one's awake and one, one part of the brain has, has had enough, it wakes up and the other part sleeps I mean just talk to the board, he gives me some amazing stories about biology and what happens in this world, right? and yet some of us, we can't give Allah a standing ovation we can't praise Him and glorify Him and say Allahu Akbar so from this point of view I want you guys to realize that when you talk to human beings go straight to that aspect of misdirected worship you know my father he attended my school band I used to play classical music classical guitar when I was non-Muslim and go to the Royal School of Music not many people know this about me right and inevitably I had to go to the school band so my dad attended and I wasn't very good at electric guitar, so I'll put the volume well, way down and have another four guitarists. They'll be making the noise. They'll be like, look at me, I'm so cool, right? <laughs> and there was a moment where I think it was an a cappella singer. And she had an amazing voice. And she basically expressed herself, and it was the climatic part of the song. It was phenomenal. And you could see that, you know, she didn't care who was around, it was just her and her expression. My dad stood up and he was going, bravo! And he's kind of. Greek accent, bravo, he was the only guy standing up because he noticed an attribute in her that deserved due praise, right? That self-expression, that amazing ability. We do this all the time, but look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The people that we praise are deficient. They're just a rearrangement of carbon. They're limited to some degree. They're not perfect. They have flaws and deficiencies. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not flawed. He is perfect. He has no deficiency and no flaw and some of us we find it very difficult to give him due praise so this is a summary of what we're going to talk about today why Allah deserves to be worshipped the first thing I want to talk about is gratitude this is extremely important because we do not understand gratitude properly in our in, in our societies right we think we should be grateful for a bigger house we, should th we think we should be grateful for a better car. We think we should be gra grateful for three meals, right? We have this kind of false social constructs that really raise the bar for gratitude from the point of view that we should be grateful for these excessive luxuries. But I want you to understand something and I want you to be able to tell humanity this too. That there is something that is priceless is priceless that is given to you freely at every moment of your existence you don't earn and you don't own there's something priceless that's given to you freely every moment of your existence that you don't earn and you don't own you know what this is it's your conscious life and you don't earn it you don't own it and you don't necessarily deserve it yet Allah gives it to you freely if someone gives you something priceless you don't earn own or deserve how should it make you feel how should it make you feel? Grateful. grateful! Grateful! Forget what you have in life, be grateful for life. And this we forget, sometimes we act as if I am the source of my own existence. This kind of false self-sufficiency, I am my own creator, right? That's how people act. And this gratitude is extremely important for us to get people to internalize. You know what? Atheists, agnostics, non-Muslims use this philosophy all the time. You see it in their self-help books. It's all about gratitude. Mm. There are so many Buddhists that talk about this concept. But we have something profound because we have the true deity to be grateful to. Mm. Right? We always say that atheists are grateful, but they got no one to be grateful to, right? So from this point of view, gratitude is the key to worship in the Islamic tradition. Look at the Quran, the sign is there. The first chapter of the Quran is what? Surah Al-Fatiha. And these seven verses are the mother of the kitab. the kitab and they summarize the whole of the Quran. The first verse talks about what? Hamd. Hamd. Gratitude. Gratitude. 
and if you don't understand this gratitude, you, your, your worship will be misdirected. You won't be able to understand your worship properly. Well, like I told my family, anything above a heartbeat is a bonus. Anything above a heartbeat is a bonus. If you truly internalize this point, not only would you want to be grateful to your Creator, we've established as a Creator, you want to be grateful to Him because He's giving to you something freely that's so priceless that you don't earn, don't, don't own, and, don't do, and you don't necessarily deserve. You should be grateful for that. You know, my grandma passed away like just over a year ago. I was very close to my grand. To be honest, I wasn't really upset about Akhirah per se. I'll tell you why. Because of what Sufyan al fari says, he says, if I had to choose between my mother and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the judgment of the day of judgment, I would choose Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's gonna, she's going to be enveloped in Allah's justice or mercy. And whatever happens, happens, right? Yes, there's that kind of fear and whatever the case may be. But I wasn't truly like broken. I was broken because I didn't do enough for her. Because now I'm going to be worried on the day of judgment that I ignored her calls. You know? You know, and because busy, right? So... And I was, I was actually in America, I was having dinner with Fahad that night, she actually called me. Yeah, yeah. And then she passed away in the morning. So, the point I'm trying to make here, just to recap, is that my grand had a little bit of money, she had like, what, 40,000 pounds or something, right? And as it is with families, there's debate and discussions on these issues. And I said to my mom, look, if we were to take her money and put it in her mouth, coin by coin, she would not be resurrected. I said, what would you do for Yaya, Granny, to be alive again? If you had a million, would you give a million? Of course. If you had two million, would you give two million? Of course. If you had a billion, would you give a billion? Of course. So what does that say about the pricelessness, of the priceless nature of life and the dunya and money itself? To get people to realize how many people are blind and say they were billionaires and ask them the question if I could give your sight back would you give me a billion? what do you think they would say? Everything. of course see and that's, we need these reminders to understand these things and gratitude is so important because we sometimes think we have to be grateful for the excessive things which is true we have to be grateful for those but what about now what you have right now? what you have right now? Don't forget, the Prophet was talking to the Sahaba and teaching them to be grateful and these people were poor. These people didn't have anything. They had one cloth and dates. And the, uh, he was teaching them to be grateful. So the point here is, we need to show to humanity that not only do they have a Rabb, a Lord, a Creator, but they have to be grateful to that Creator for these very basic points. And the reason I'm giving this basic point is because not everybody's happy in life. Not everybody has luxuries. So you go straight to the fundamentals. Make them realize life itself. So, before we continue to say why Allah deserves to be worshipped, let's now talk about what worship is. Worship can be described in the following way, my beloved brothers. To know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to obey Allah and to direct all our acts of worship towards Allah internal and external acts of worship to Allah alone this I feel is a very comprehensive definition of worship it's been taken from my previous ulama and I think it's extremely important to define worship in this way because you remember the art of Tao is using the right language because when you say worship to the Western audience what do they think and feel? physical action, Sunday service, right? But worship in Islam is very profound and we need to learn to use the right type of language in order for people to understand what worship really is. In actual fact, what's very important is the use of language. We spoke about this in the car, I think, a few days ago. Because, for example, I refuse to call Salah prayer. If we do that, you've got it wrong. Prayer is dua. You're asking for something. Salah is not asking for something. It's a praise, it's a hamd, it's a dhikr, it's a submission, it's a divine discourse, it's so many different things. How can you use the word prayer to, I'm going to go pray five times a day. Oh really? I pray more than that, I pray all the time, I ask God all the time for things. Do you see my point? We need to revive the art of using the right language. Even the concept of fear of God. Fear of God in the Christian tradition is very different from the fear of God in the Islamic tradition. But we use the same terminology and even in the Quranic translations we use the same terminology, yet the connotations from a social 
point of view and personal point of view and a historical point of view are totally different. So you may be using the same words, but they don't mean the same thing. So I think it's very important for us to actually define our concepts as best as possible or use the most appropriate language. And this is a challenge for the du'at as well. Yes, there are times you have to use similar words to bring that connection, that commonality, but it requires sometimes a caveat and a discussion on what that really means. This is very important. Because even me, when I heard Muslims would pray, like my sister, pray five times a day? Why only five? <laughs> right? Because first she's thinking, I'm asking God for something. Do you see? But prayer really is dua. Salah is like some kind of spiritual program. <laughs> I don't know. I don't. The point is, it's important to really use language in an appropriate way. And this even in social political discourse as well. So, knowing Allah. As you know, the, the ulama have discussed various categories, but just for ease of use, let's just remind ourselves about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Knowing Allah essentially means affirming the oneness of His creativity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the sole creator, the sole sustainer and maintainer of everything that exists. We affirm the oneness of His names and attributes. We don't compare Allah to anything. There is nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We affirm His names and attributes and we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we believe in His maximal perfection. We believe these names and attributes are not deficient and they're not flawed. They cannot be compared to human beings, right? We can't humanize His names and attributes and we can't deify human beings to say that they are just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most perfect being from the point of view that His names and attributes are to the highest degree possible without any deficiency or without any flaw. We also affirm the oneness of His worship. We believe that we must direct all our acts of worship, internal and external, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Without any kind of intermediaries, without any misdirection, solely, directly, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So why dedicate worship to Allah alone? So there are a few arguments I've taken from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I think really provide a phenomenal spiritual existential argument, if you like, why he deserves to be worshipped. Because remember, it's in the context that we already affirmed his creativity. We affirm there's a creator, argument from contingency, argument from design, Quranic argument from God's existence, the argument from rationality, the argument from morality. We have all of these things in place. So now we're going to talk about why Allah deserves to be worshipped. The first point, and this is so significant, especially in a materialistic capitalist context when we act like businessmen all the time, even with friendships. You give me something, I give you something. You scratch my back, I'll scratch your back, right? The first point is, Allah's right to worship is a necessary fact of His existence. It has nothing to do with what He's given you. It's a necessary fact of who He is by definition. Allah, Al-Ilah, the Arabic linguists say, the object of worship. He deserves worship by the very fact that He is the only being worthy of worship. It is a necessary fact of His existence, regardless how He has chosen to manifest His bounty to you. He could have given you the crumbs of the universe, but He deserves worship because of who He is. And this is very important, especially for new Muslims. Especially for new Muslims and especially for non-Muslims who really want to understand the concept of worship. Because many people think, I'm worshipping God because I'm grateful He gave me a house. And when He doesn't give you a house, then they leave worship. I met the student once, he said, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala five times a day. I was praying to Allah, doing tahajjud, all of these things to get good exam results. I failed, so I stopped praying. And I said, who the hell are you bro? He was probably thinking you're going to get this nice compassionate counsellor. Hamza is, you know, Mr. Compassionate, but not on this issue. I said, who are you? Who the hell are you? So you think you're on par with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Like, he's a businessman and you are his business viral uh, rival? And you're basically, you know, having this kind of contract together? <laughs> you, you think Salah is like coins at a bank and you're going to get something back and have interest? I said, are you insane? Allah deserves worship. Even if you have no legs and arms, bro. Allah deserves worship even if He's given you nothing. It's the only thing you have is life. You need to realign how you see yourself, how you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and how you see the amazing bounties that you have ignored because you think 
about Allah in a way that you shouldn't think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he got it. And that was through experience because some people need that sometimes, right? So this is a very important point to, to address, especially new Muslims. Because new Muslims, they'll become new Muslim and the community may forget them. Everyone gets busy. Yeah, call me bro anytime, he's a hundred dollars. Then the next Friday, they need to learn Juma prayer, this, that and the other. And they got problems, they got chucked out of their home, they make the calls. I'm too busy, busy bro. I'm on holiday with my family, bye. Right? They're going to face tests and trials. We don't want them to move away from the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because number one, that's what's going to give them true spiritual strength. And He deserves worship because of who He is, not necessarily what He has given you. Absolutely. Very, very important for us to understand this point. Conceptually and internalize it when we're discussing with people about worship. Because we say, oh look, God has given you so many amazing things. I don't talk about that first. Because what if those things go? <laughs> you have to make them understand who Allah is. And He is Al-Ilah. He is the deity that is deserved of all worship. And worship is a necessary fact of His existence. Second point. Allah has created and sustains everything. So many ayat on this issue. Think about this. If Allah is your Rabb, if He is your Creator who sustains you and maintains you, then He created all the asbab, all the physical causes you use to maintain yourself and sustain yourself and approach pleasure, run away from pain, all of these things. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Since that is the case, then you should be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and gratitude is a form of worship. This is extremely important for us to understand. Because sometimes we think, you know, I own this. You know, I said to Zakaria once, no more mine. Where is this mine? I mean, I got quite angry with him. What do you mean mine? My Lego. There's no my Lego. Everything is, is owned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's just giving it to you and you have delegated authority to use it in an appropriate way. So if you don't share it, you're not using it in an appropriate way. I'm trying to make the distance themselves from the dunya from that point of view for them to understand that Yes, it's mine that I have delegated authority, but it's not mine that I have absolute ownership. There is a subtle spiritual difference here. Everything belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like, you know, some brothers, they, 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 they give money, right? They obviously give money to Ayer and other charities. And you speak to these brothers and they say, I say, subhanAllah bro, jazakallah hai. I say, well, it's not my money. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm just a trustee here and I'm just using it in a way that's pleasing him. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. The third point, Allah provides us with innum innumerable favors. Very famous ayah in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you could not count, enumerate the blessings of Allah. Now I wanted to find an example that you can use for someone who suffers in life and someone who is happy. So it transcends their context. I think I found it. What is the physical cause that keeps us alive? Heartbeat. Heartbeat. So here's a challenge. I've done this before and people are like, like they, they can't respond. The heartbeat is the physical cause, the asbab that keeps us alive. And you know how precious life is. If your loved ones were to pass away tomorrow, God forbid, and you had billions of dollars, and someone said, just increase their life for another week, but give me the billions of dollars, would you give it to me? Absolutely. It just shows how important life is compared to anything in the dunya. If I said to you, you have 500 heartbeats left, but in order to have another 50,000 heartbeats, you have to give me your house. Put your hand up, who's going to give me a house? Everybody. <laughs> Absolutely. So look at this, look how heedless, a state of ghafla, aren't we sometimes? Now here's the challenge, count all your heartbeats, okay. <laughs> it's impossible, it's physically, metaphysically impossible to count all your heartbeats. For, for the first three years you got a backlog, one, two, three, because you don't know how to count. When you're sleeping, you can't count your heartbeats, right? So isn't it true that you can't enumerate the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And this is one of an infinite number of blessings. It's our job, brothers and mashaykh, to really revive the hearts of the non-Muslim community and the Muslim community. Show to them. This is 
the concept of gratitude in Islam. And I'm telling you, I'm a true believer. If they have this internalized, how can you be sad? How can you be sad? You know, this is why, you know, when you talk about dhikr in an Nawawi's book in Kitab al Athkar, he talks about, you know, we should be people of dhikr, obviously. But our dhikr is very mechanical. I call it AK 47 dhikr. <coughs> After salah, it's spawn, 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 right? <laughs> There's nothing there. There's no meaning or feeling. Now, and now he talks about how, you know, when you do it, do it slowly. You know, make sure you could at least hear it. Subhanallah. <laughs> Subhanallah. And it's not just a, an utterance with your mouth, but your heart is in tune. Now, because I've tried to internalize this, I get so confused what to be grateful about. So all I think about is my heartbeat. <laughs> That's all I could do, right? Because I get so overwhelmed by the infinite number of blessings. I'm like, Subhan, let, me be, let me at least be grateful for the thing that is pumping, right? That's allowing me to, to, to stay alive. And we have to revive our ibadah that way, that the heart is in line with our afkar, with our ibadah. The next point, if we love ourselves, we must love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I took this argument, plagiarized it, and I'm so proud of plagiarizing it from the proof of Islam, Al-Ghazali. In his book, his 36th book in the Ihya, which is on Muhabba, which is on love. Al Ghazali makes a very interesting point. Something that Eric from the psychoanalyst said as well. That human beings should have self love. Now, this self love is not narcissism. It's not like, oh, look at me. This self love is that you want to prolong your existence. You don't want pain, right? You want pleasure. And. You're going to use all the physical causes that you have at your disposal to actually approach pleasure and run away from pain. This is a form of self-love. You want goodness for yourself. The very fact you want paradise is because you have this form of self-love. Now Al-Ghazali makes a beautiful argument. He basically says, well if you love yourself, you have to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a logical and spiritual necessary conclusion. Because who created you? Who is the source of love? Who is the source of love and mercy? Who is the source of your pleasure? Who created the asbab, the physical causes that you use to embrace pleasure and run away from pain? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you are heedless not to realize this, then you're like drunk with the dunya. <laughs> so if we love ourselves, we must love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another argument is that Allah is the loving. And remember, a form of worship is to love Allah, right? So Allah is Al-Wudud, coming from the Arabic word Wud, which means the loving that is giving. And He's excessive in His love. And His love is so pure. Because Allah is Al-Ghani, He is independent and free of any need and He is rich. But yet He loves and He gains nothing by loving. His love is even greater than any worldly type of love, even a mother's love. Because a mother, she needs to love. She gains by loving. It defines, it makes it complete. Allah is already complete. Yet He loves. Imagine how pure the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. So if I told you, even from a human perspective, someone comes into this room and I say, this is the most loving human being, I don't care if you're an alpha male, you're going to be like, I want to know this person. I want to know who this person is, right? I don't care if you have all of these kind of like, you know, no nah, man, I'm a bro. If I found out that someone walks into this room and they're the most loving human being ever, I want to connect with that person. I want to know what makes them tick. I want to understand them, know them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is perfect in His love, excessive in His love, maximally perfect, no deficiency on floor, so pure love because He gains nothing by loving, yet He loves. So why don't you want to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? SubhanAllah. Just by reflecting on who Allah is, then you would want to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other point, worship is part of who we are. Worshipping Allah is part of who we are. We spoke about the fitrah. We speak, we speak about it every day now. Just to remind ourselves that these arguments and the things that we learn are, 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 are not ends, they're means to awaken the truth within. Worship is a fundamental feature of the fitrah and who we are. If you don't worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are actually forgetting your own self. What does Allah say in the Quran? If you forget Allah, Allah will make you forget your own selves. Your spiritual identity, what makes you complete as a human being, is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you go away from that worship, then you will forget who you really are and you'll be in a state of heedlessness, a state of spiritual chaos. Just reflect on your own lives, brothers, please. 
when you slightly dwindled away from the type of worship that you do, how did you feel? How did you feel? Be honest, be honest. I'll tell you the truth as well. Sometimes I try and do dhikr morning and evening. I don't do it all the time. Sometimes there's months I don't do it. And my wife knows. She says, shaitan's on your face. She knows when I'm not doing dhikr. She's not, we've been together for like over a decade, yeah? She's like, shaitan's on your face. Shaitan's got you. And I get so aggressive inside because she's right. <laughs> she's right. She's right. And she's very honest with me. And she knows. And she could see even from the outward appearance on is this guy doing the stuff that he needs to do in order to protect himself because you're in the da'wah field and also just to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just look at your life. The days you used to do tahajjud and the days you didn't. Or the days you read Quran and the days you didn't. Right? There is always a correlation. Ask the brothers, even the brothers know this isn't me sometimes. I get into different states. Sometimes I'm passive aggressive, sometimes I'm alpha male, sometimes I'm a walkover. Like, what's wrong with this guy? He's either got bipolar schizophrenia or, <laughs> which is probably true, or he's not connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And we even do this, we know, alhamdulillah, we're quite close with the brothers, you know. Sometimes we say, bro, you know, you didn't pray today or something's going on, what's up? You know, we could tell by their faces sometimes. Like we, help, we try and help each other. But the point is, worship is part of who we are. Remember what Allah says in the Qur'an. Consider the situation of two people. One man is a slave to many masters and they're all quarreling. Another man is a slave to one. Whose condition's best? We need to make them realize that everyone worships something. Everyone wants to know something, love something, obey something and direct their acts of worship to something. I am telling you, analyze anyone's life. A mushrik, an atheist, a humanist, anyone. They worship something. They want to know something the most, they want to love something the most, they want to obey something the most, and they want to direct their acts of worship like gratitude to something the most. Let me, let me give you a crude example, Justin Bieber, right? How many of these teenage women, and even men, they want to know him the most? Nam, true? Twitter profile, Instagram, following, magazines, they want to know Justin Bieber the most. Number two, they love him the most. They'll do anything to see him, to hold his hand, to buy his merchandise, to even catch his sweaty t-shirt, right? They won't love him the most. They obey him. If he says, spinach is good for you, everyone will buy spinach. That's how marketing works. When President Clinton started eating spinach, the spinach sales rose. That's how marketing works. So they obey him from that point of view. If he said, right, Nike is the best clothes, everyone was going to buy Nike, the people that really have that infatuation for him. And they direct acts of worship to him. Like what? You see the, the girls' diaries. I'm so happy because Justin Bieber's alive. He makes sense of my life. I really want to see him. You know, he's my everything. This is ibadah. This is worship. Now this is a crude example. But my beloved Ikhwan and Mashaykh, it could be ourselves and our egos, especially as du'at. And this is to advice to myself. I want to free myself from hypocrisy. This is advice to myself first and foremost. Because sometimes you could worship your ego. And you want to know yourself the most. Right? Yeah? You want to obey your nafs the most. You love yourself the most. And you direct your acts of worship to yourself the most. By what? By referring to your limited aql. By referring to yourself as that you're the source of your goodness. May Allah free us from this and protect us from this. So when you understand the concept of worship, you apply it as a template to everything. So worshipping is part of who we are. Final point, obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is another form of worship. To obey Allah. Now this is very interesting because it links to who Allah is. He's Al-Hakim, Al-Alim. He's the wise, the knowing. So when He makes a command, we know it's good for us. We know it's something that you have to obey. We shouldn't be like shaitan who rejected the ultimate authority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by denying to bow down to Adam, right? And obedience is a form of worship. Now some of the secular folk, you know, in a postmodern context, especially Muslims, they don't like this obedience thing, right? Obe obey? No, this is, you know, my free choice thing. Shut up. You're a slave of Allah. Shut up. Sometimes some Muslims need this, right? Within context, in the framework of Rahmah and mercy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's true, some people just need a slap down, intellectually and spiritually. Who are you? What do you mean? And to make them understand their own life. You obey things all the time. And you're not going to even incline and want to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
You obey the pilot when he says put on your seatbelt because of turbulence. You obey the medical practitioner that says you have this disease, you must take this medicine. You obey everything, friends, family, politicians, Traffic lights. Traffic lights. <laughs> All of these so-called authorities in your life. But you're not going to obey the ultimate authority and you find it irrational? That's, that's the discourse of shaitan. <laughs> Isn't it? Allah is the ultimate authority. Remember who Allah is. Al-Aleem, Al-Hakim. He is the one who has the totality of wisdom and knowledge. He knows everything. He wants good for us. So we obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I truly believe if you internalize these points, and there are others, but if you internalize them and put them in your discourse when you're talking to people, after making them realize and they have that internal awakening that there is a Rabb, there is a Creator, or this is the true conception of Allah, because some people believe in a Creator, but they believe in the wrong conception, like the Trinity for example, right? Once they understand who Allah is, then this is a necessary aspect of your da'wah. You have to, at some point, focus on worship. If you don't, then there'll be a big problem. And they may become Muslim and they'll suffer the problems I suffered, that I'm still suffering the consequences of. First four years being Muslim and you're an abstract intellectual robot with nothing in your heart and then you get very bitter about your whole life because you were taught a form of Islam that had almost nothing to do with the essence and inner dimensions of our tradition. Worship is everything. Now, a common contention, and we'll finish in five minutes, inshallah. A common contention is that does Allah need us to worship Him? Right? You always hear this in the popular culture da'wah. Now, it's very simple. Who is Allah? Always refer back to who Allah is, His names and attributes. He's Al Ghani. He is free and independent. He doesn't need our worship. If the whole universe were to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it won't increase His bounty. And if the whole universe were not to worship Allah, it won't decrease His bounty. This is our Rabb. So we clearly say that Allah is absolutely transcendent, He is absolutely independent and free. That worship is for us, not for Allah from that point of view. He doesn't need our worship. Now, but why did Allah create us to worship Him? Right, who's going to answer that? Very quickly. Why did Allah create us to worship Him though? To show His mercy. To show His mercy. What, what other reason? Yes. To show that who He is. To show that who He is. To manifest His will. To manifest His will. That's a very interesting point. And I think it's a very powerful argument. Because you can, you can, you can, you can answer this in two ways. Well fine, Allah doesn't need us to worship Him, but why did He do it in the first place? The first answer is, it's in line with His wisdom, that's absolute and total, and you will never understand. And that's actually a rational answer. The second point is I think is very powerful, you just mentioned Mulana Saab. What's very powerful is this. Creating us to worship Him was a necessary, a necessary manifestation of Allah's names and attributes. Yes, like a ghafoor. Absolutely. Remember this, God is, Allah is a maximally good being, therefore His actions are not only good, they are expressions of His nature. Allah loves good. He created rational creatures who freely choose to worship Him and do good, some even exulting in virtue like the prophets, then being given eternal life in the presence of Allah to pass an eternity of intimate love and companionship. It's the greatest story ever told. Since God loves all good, it is clear why He would make this story a reality. Allahu Akbar. In summary, Allah created us to worship Him because He wants good for us and He wants us to go to paradise. And it was an inevitable, manip it was an inevitable manifestation of His names and attributes. And what's very interesting, and it's exactly what you said, Ya yeah, Imam, may Allah bless you and preserve you and increase you. Allah has made it clear that those who attain paradise have been created to experience His mercy. We have been created to experience the mercy of Allah. As Allah says, if your Lord had pleased, He had made all people a single community, but they continue to have their differences, except those on whom your Lord has mercy, for He created them to be this way. And as I said, Allah created us to worship Him because it was an inevitable manifestation. manifestation of who Allah is. So, brothers, true liberation is to 
worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we mentioned. And I want you to realize something. In our Western discourse of liberation and freedom, in this Western discourse, sometimes we jump into this, but we forget how we should truly define freedom. The ruh, raha, liberation, ease. The soul wants that and it can only be found in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It can only be found in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want you to compare inside yourself. Think about all the moments of bliss you had in your ibadah and compare it with getting more dunya blessings. Compare it with another house. Compare it with another wife, for example, more children. And I'm telling you, I was there, we get stressed sometimes, right? You know, everyone's doing admin work in this office, yeah? And everyone's got different roles and yeah, it was like a mismatch, yeah? It was a small team, but we tried to do our best. May Allah bless the brothers, yeah? And I was like, we were talking about other blessings and some junior things. I said, listen guys, don't worry about this, bro. And one brother wants to get married and stuff. I said, look, nothing. Even in your honeymoon day, nothing is going to compare to that few moments that Allah has blessed you with. That you really felt dhikr, that you really felt your ibadah. Not because you chased the feeling, but you did it because He deserved worship. And this is another point you have to understand. Don't worship the feeling, worship Allah. Ibn Qayyum al jawziyah he made this point very careful. He said, don't worship the feeling. The feeling is an inevitability of good worship. But don't worship because of the feeling. And that's very subtle here, okay? And that's something we need to teach to our new Muslims as well. That, you know, sometimes some of the ulama say, just, you know, just by your bones being settled, that's enough, yeah? In terms of your khushu. So anyway, the point being is, you know, that, that liberation, that sense of spiritual sakina and freedom that you maybe have been given once every decade, you know? Like hajj, hajj season's coming. Wallahi, hajj is my home. Wallahi. My wife has <laughs> seen me relax and slept, slept mo most in my life. I don't sleep that well, generally speaking. And Hajj in Mina, people called me the sleeping man. I was reading Surah Hajj and I was falling asleep. And it was blissful sleep. Muzdalifah was Jannah. Jannah. Right? Hajj for me is home. You know what's very interesting about Hajj? And we'll, we'll end on this in terms of Ibadah. You know, Ibadah does this to you. It truly liberates you by making you understand who you truly are. In Western spiritual discourse, what do we do? We add to ourselves courage, learn this, do this, right? All these actions and these other epithets about who you are. But really, Islamic spirituality is not adding, it's removing. You already are good. Your fitra is already worshipping, right? Wants to worship. You're already in that state of goodness. What does Hajj do? If you haven't been to Hajj, you're going to feel this inshallah. Yeah. May, bless you, may Allah bless you with accepted Hajj. Yeah. So when you go to Hajj, and when I went to Hajj, I'll tell you what happened to me. I looked the same as everybody else. I lost my individuality. Because that's ego, isn't it? Even who you think you are. You're not speak anymore. I even forgot I was, what gender I was. Yeah? Honestly. I don't know who I was. I forgot my name. I forgot almost my personality. I forgot, or I, I was de-individualized from the point of view that me being a father, a speaker, someone who studies, someone who does this, was so irrelevant. So irrelevant. All that linguistic wrapping that my ego has linguistically labeled and wrapped my ruh, my fitra, was unraveled and unwrapped. And what was left? Nothing. And all I found was an abid. Just wanting to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> That's why I say to my wife, <laughs> I want to go back home. <laughs> As Muhammad Iqbal said, the poet, he said, This one prostration which you find too difficult frees you from a thousand prostrations. If you don't worship Allah, you're worshipping something else. My beloved brothers, may Allah bless you for your time and apologies for you know, my expressive state. May Allah bless you. Please internalize these points. We're going to review them during um, the review sessions. And uh, let's now organize and get in the cars and have some food. May Allah bless you. Wallahi. I love you for the sake of Allah. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.